early morning on the 13th of June, 1944, at an anti-aircraft battery in the district of Woolwich, London. The men pass their time by a water tanker, telling stories, trying to keep awake. It's been two weeks since the last air raid, and a week since the last time the sirens had screamed their dreadful warning, coinciding with the Allied landings on Normandy. But they weren't foolish enough to rest easy. They'd been warned by their superiors that the Germans planned to get revenge with a new and novel weapon. Suddenly, the air raid sirens come to life, pulling the men out of their discussion. They run for their posts and man a 40mm Bofors anti-air gun. Before their eyes, there's a strange sight. Not the sweeping searchlights illuminating the clouds for a swarm of bombers, but instead, all focus on a single, fast-approaching spot in the sky. The gunner prepares his aim and opens fire. The rhythmic bangs of the gun come to life as the mysterious enemy dashes overhead at astonishing speeds, sweeping the landscape with a deep and deafening buzz. The gunner turns the weapon as fast as he can, but the strange machine outruns him and he scores no hits. The men watch astonished as it flies away. The light of its fire-spitting engine are obvious to see. One of the soldiers exclaims, Nathan is on fire. But he was wrong. The machine continues on its path towards central London, untouched by the harassment from the anti-air weapons. Then the engine cuts, and the land is shrouded in chilling silence. Moments later, an explosion is heard in the distance. The machine struck on Grove Road, just two kilometers from the Tower of London, it's a weapon unlike anything seen before, flying to its target with no pilot at the controls, carrying a deadly warhead and launched from the safety of enemy territory hundreds of kilometers away. It's the world's first ever cruise missile, the V-1 Flying Bomb. We'd like to thank War Thunder for sponsoring today's video. With incredible graphics in 4K resolution and authentic sound effects, War Thunder transports you to the front lines of combat. War Thunder brings you the most comprehensive vehicle combat game ever made with over 2,000 tanks, planes, helicopters and ships to choose from. Whether you're looking for a fast-paced match or more realistic and tactical experience, War Thunder has it all. And it's available on PC, Xbox, Series X and S, PlayStation 5, and previous console generations. Get into the action of War Thunder now by clicking the link in the description. You'll receive a large free bonus pack with multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters, and much more. Don't miss out on the ultimate gaming experience. Play War Thunder today. While the British intelligence gathering had given a clue to high command about the existence of this vengeance weapon, the nature of the attack left them stumped. Its high speed, small size and low altitude completely throws off a defensive strategy, perfected to fight big, slow and high-flying bombers. On the night of the 16th of June, the first mass V-1 attack commenced. German forces launched 244 missiles across the channel. The 3.7-inch anti-aircraft weapons were completely out of their element. They were too slow to turn and their fire control systems couldn't calculate a firing solution before the target was already long gone. Smaller anti-aircraft weapons had better luck in striking down 21 doodlebugs, as they became known, with great effort, but they were nowhere near effective enough. Meanwhile, in the air, pilots were having a frustrating time. Radar stations struggled to provide location information quickly enough, leaving the pilots little time to act before the missile reached London. Even those who did acquire targets found them hard to engage. The Merlin-powered Spitfires were too slow to keep up with the missiles, and the few pilots that did shoot down a target were being surprised with the V-1 detonating violently in the air, endangering the pilots. As news of this threat circulated in the radio, Pilots were forced to fire from further away, making the shot even harder and the window of opportunity even smaller.
By the dawn of the 17th of June, fighters had shot down 12 flying bombs. Meanwhile, over 100 explosions rocked British soil, with 73 striking London. Immediately, the Royal Air Force got to work. This could not happen again. The entire strategy was reworked and multiple new inventions were green-lit. Retrofits to AA guns for faster traverse, new rules of engagement, better communication channels for radar, barrage balloons, and much more. They were all tested and deployed in record time. But the most important piece of the puzzle was the fighters. Fighters capable of keeping up with the flying bombs in numbers large enough to keep a constant presence in the sky, ready to repel any and all attacks. Immediately, several squadrons armed with the fastest fighters already in service were summoned to the area between Pas Calais and London. These forces included mosquitoes, hawker tempests, hurricanes and more. Anything and everything that stood half a chance was brought forward. One aircraft in particular stood out the Griffin-powered Supermarine Spitfire Mark 14. It was a modification of the iconic aircraft that had the equally iconic Merlin engine swapped for a much more powerful and complex Griffin engine with a top speed of 718 kilometers an hour and keeping the excellent maneuverability of the famous fighter. It promised to be exactly the weapon they needed. Among the units assigned the task for interception, stationed to the squadron is Australian National Field Officer Kenneth Roy Collier, equipped with the famous Spitfire Mark 14. Collier is on a patrol of England's south coast, which he later described as rather dull. He'd already taken down a flying bomb earlier in the evening, so his ammunition was running low. He's thinking about returning to base when he takes another look towards the coast and spots another V1 flying in over the shore. He knows he's got hardly any ammunition, but with no other real option, he turns his trusty spit towards the incoming target. He tracks the V1 carefully as he prepares to attack. He's only going to have one shot at this. He takes a deep breath and dives. His Spitfire rapidly picks up speed as he comes in fast from above, the cigar-shaped bomb drifting into his crosshairs. Collier pulls the trigger. It's a short burst as the target grows in his sights but he witnesses all of his bullets fall short. Rapidly getting too close for comfort, he readjusts and fires again. His cannons unleash the last of the ammunition reserves in a desperate last shot. The bullets fly true and on target, and they strike the bomb's metal fuselage. But nothing happens. Collier can't believe his eyes as the flying bomb continues on its path, undisturbed. He voices his disappointment into the void as he pulls up alongside the V1. With no ammunition, he can do nothing but watch as a bomb trundles onward, steady and unobstructed. He would later state, it gave me a feeling of powerlessness to sit there watching it travel on and not be able to stop it. He keeps watching it for a while, observing every detail. He attempts to read the German writing on the body, but he can't understand it. The tail section of the bomb catches his eye as he spots the elevators and rudder wiggling non-stop. The gyro, constantly adjusting to keep the machine on target. It's then when he gets an idea. Carefully, he maneuvers his Spitfire's wing underneath the wing of the bomb, moving slowly but surely. His laser focused on the distance separating them, being exceptionally careful, as a mid-air collision would likely leave nothing of him and the plane. But then he realizes the bomb's wing is shining red. Instinctively, he pulls away from the strange sight, part of his mind fearing the bomb might be red hot but almost immediately afterwards, he realizes the red shine had come from a navigation light on the tip of his own wing. Calming down and feeling a little foolish, he once again maneuvers his Spitfire until the V1's wing gently comes into contact with his own. Collier's heart skips a beat halfway, expecting it to detonate upon contact, but nothing happens. Gently, he tilts up his wing, twisting the bomb in the air until it slides right off. But to Collier's disappointment, the V1 immediately straightens itself out and continues on its flight. But Collier isn't ready to give up. He knows gyroscopes. He knows that if he can get it deviated enough, the gyro will fail. He only needs to do it harder. 
Once again, he expertly maneuvers his machine into position and lifts up the V1's wing. But as it begins to slide off like last time, Collier flicks his stick and throws the V1's wing upwards. The flying bomb rolls over in the air and its gyro becomes overwhelmed. It falls earthbound as it spins wildly out of control. Collier looks at it go until it impacts in an empty field and detonates with a breathtaking shockwave sweeping the landscape. He would later state, I felt absolutely jubilant and a bit staggered. I think I said to myself, gee, it can be done that way. Collier's exploits would gain local fame as the madman who tipped a bomb. After Collier, multiple pilots discovered that they could maneuver their wing under the V1 and flip them over in the air, throwing off the gyro. The news spread across the force and many repeated the feat when facing weapon failures and depleted ammunition. The V1 defense campaign also saw the introduction of the first Allied jet fighter, the Gloucester Meteor. They were still prototypes, so their pilots struggled with unreliability, but they still performed the first jet versus jet victory in history when flying officer Dixie Dean tipped a flying bomb with his wing after his 20 mm cannons jammed. Just two months after the introduction of the V1, the launch sites in Pas de Calais were systematically captured by the advancing Allied forces, greatly reducing the frequency of V1 attacks towards London. But that wouldn't be the end of the Germans' terror bombing. While V1 strikes waned, a new, more sinister weapon lay in store. Get into the action of War Thunder now by clicking the link in the description. You'll receive a large free bonus pack with multiple premium vehicles, a premium account, boosters and much more. Don't miss out on the ultimate gaming experience. Play War Thunder today. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to the channel and please watch more videos of ours. Thank you.